Good evening, and a warm welcome to you all. It is so good to see you. You're in the room here. You're not at home on the sofa watching television. We're, we're here together. It's, it's really wonderful to see you. Welcome to those who are catching up on live stream or maybe catching up later in the week. Um, we hope that you enjoy uh, meeting with us every bit as much as we do here in the building. As I've said, it's great to be able to meet here in person. Uh, and we understand uh, on an evening like this and during a week like this that we come from many different churches, uh, many different denominations. Uh, we understand that each church and possibly every denomination is approaching the, the season that we find ourselves in, possibly in a slightly different way. Uh, the COVID situation and the government guidelines. This week here at Hamilton Road, we're following the current guidelines of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Uh, so in accordance with those guidelines, uh, we'd like to ask that you continue uh, to wear your masks um, at all points while you're in the premises, even while you're seated. Uh, and we want to thank you uh, for your understanding and your cooperation with us in that. Uh, my name is Christoph Ebbinghaus. I'm the minister here at Hamilton Road. Uh, although this is my first time to welcome you as the minister here to Hamilton Road, it's not, it's not my first time here at Bangor Worldwide. I, I think uh, I was working it out this week. I, I probably have about 40 years of history with Bangor Worldwide since my mom and dad brought me along uh, as a wee boy. Uh, so I've come here for many many missionary conventions over the years, but I haven't been around as much for quite a while, so it, it's great to be back. Although I'm welcoming you to our place here this evening, uh, we're hosting this service in partnership with our brothers and sisters from Hamilton Road Baptist, so a, a warm welcome to any Baps who are here this evening. Great to have you with us, and uh, a welcome to Pastor Johnny McLaughlin. Johnny will be chairing our, our meeting this evening, so he'll uh, do a lot more with the service. He'll make uh, further introductions. Uh, I would, however, briefly like to welcome uh, Jonathan and Michael, who will both be contributing to the service this evening. We look forward to hearing what you both have to say. I think I've welcomed everyone I need to welcome. Just now, let's continue to worship together the living God who welcomes us here in the name of his son, Jesus. A couple of songs as we open our evening together. All creatures of our God and King and awake, awake, O Zion. Will you rise to your feet? Join me and worship the living God. Yeah. 
Well, you may take your seats. It is not wonderful to be singing about this great theme that we're looking at this week, that our God reigns. Just as we were singing it, it reminded me of Matthew chapter 1, that great prophecy that was fulfilled, that the baby would be born who would be called Emmanuel, God with us. And then as God, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave that great commission uh, to his disciples before he left, he said, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Two bookends of Matthew's gospel, the very presence of God amongst his people on mission together. So it's great that we gather tonight uh, to celebrate all that God is doing uh, as Hamilton Road Baptist, Hamilton Road Presbyterian, and the whole Bangor Worldwide Fellowship meeting to see what God is going to do in the nations in these days. Well, it's my duty tonight to keep you informed of all the announcements that are going uh, to happen in the coming uh, days. Just to let you know about the morning prayer meeting uh, led by the Reverend Amir. It'll be held in the Welcome Center. That's my left, most of your rights, just out there as you were coming in. God's Great Big World is a special online event for children, and it's going to be tomorrow morning from 11.30 a.m. until 12.30. So if you, go, if you go to the website for most things, basically you'll make my job redundant. But in order to inform you to make your way to the website, uh, please uh, consider the prayer meeting, then the great event for children. Also let you know about tomorrow night, the evening meeting will commence at 7.30 uh, with the speakers, uh, one being Graham Eduardes from the Acts 29 Church Planting Network. And we're also going to have a focus on Afghanistan, and we can't introduce the speaker formally tonight uh, for safety reasons, as you will understand, but please do come tomorrow night, get registered for that online to hear what God is doing in this needy land, particularly of Afghanistan. Also, just to highlight the missions uh, exhibition, there's so many great resources over there. You don't want to miss that. Make sure you get over there at least once this week just to meet the different people on the mission stands and to see what God is doing all around the world through their agencies. Just to highlight about the offerings, I encourage you to use the thank offering envelopes, which you'll see are not under your feet. And I don't think they're in the seat in front of you. But when you're leaving tonight, there'll be a couple of folks who will uh, very happily give you an offering envelope, which they would love you uh, to help if you can, uh, all that God is doing around the world. If you look at some of the statistics uh, that have been provided by us, by Cecil, our treasurer, over the last years, you'll see the incredible amounts that you have given to God's mission uh, through this convention. So if God is leading you, please do take one of those thank offering envelopes. And please, if you can, uh, do become a gift aider uh, with that. I think those are all of the announcements, but if you do go to the website, you will find all of them ready and waiting for you. But let's come to uh, the Lord in prayer this evening. Later, uh, uh, Bishop will be looking at uh, Psalm 97, but I want to use the words of Psalm 96 just to help us in our time of prayer before we, before we sing again. So let's just pray. Our Father and our God, we come to sing to you a new song. We come to sing to you, our Lord, with all the earth. We come tonight to sing to you, to bless your name, to tell of your salvation from day to day, to declare your glory among the nations, your marvelous works among all the peoples, for you alone are great. You are greatly to be praised. You are to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But you are Lord, you made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before you. Strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. We come to you, our Father, tonight to ascribe to you ascribe to you the glory to your name, to bring an offering, to come into your presence, to worship you in the splendor of holiness, to tremble before you, to say as a people tonight, you are God, you reign. And our Father, it is our prayer that as we continue tonight, as your people, as we assemble together to lift up your name in, in song to hear, your word read, to declare that you alone are God and that there is no other. In many ways tonight, our Father, we submit ourselves at your feet. 
We praise you tonight, our Father, that we have access into your very presence through the person and work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, that we can partner with him in this great mission to see a people called out from every tribe and tongue and nation and language. Father, would you challenge us this week? Would your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us, those of us who have ears to hear, whether you're encouraging us to go across the fence, across the street, or to the very ends of the earth? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, stand to sing again. Another uh, great uh, actually, we're not going to sing. We're going to have an interview. I was just, Clara was keeping you on your toes there. I'm going to hand back to the Reverend Ebbing House, who will keep us moving. Thank you. Um, just now, I'm going to take a, a moment to interview a member of our congregation here who is just about to go off on short, short term missions in a, a few weeks' time. I've known Kate Campbell since the day she was born. Um, in fact, I've known of her since before that. Now, in case that's starting to sound a little bit creepy, that's just my way of saying I'm her uncle. Uh, I'm part of her family. Uh, Kate, great to have you here with us this evening. Kate, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself for those of us who don't know you as well as I do. Good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be here this evening with you. Um, my name's Kate Campbell. Um, and just before I begin, I'd love to say a huge thank you to Worldwide um, and to Hamilton Road Presbyterian for having me um, this evening. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about myself. I'm Kate, I'm 21. Um, I've been coming to Hamilton Road uh, my whole life. Um, and during the year I study at the University of Glasgow where I study French and Spanish. Great, so Kate, that's what you normally do. You, you study uh, in Glasgow, French and Spanish. What is it you're planning to do that's different in this incoming year? Yeah, so as a languages student, um, I'm required to take a year abroad as part of my course. So I've decided to take this year and um, to take the opportunity to head out to Spain with European Christian Mission and um, to fill, fulfill that part of my course. Um, so I'm gonna be heading out there at the end of September um, um, what I'm going to be doing there um, is working um, in a town called Roqueta de Mar, which is in the southeast of Spain, um, just outside the city of Almeria. Um, and while that is a really lovely and beautiful part of the world, um, the weather's certainly better than that here in Bangor, um, relatively speaking, um, the town I'll be living in is nearly unreached in terms of the gospel. Um, so in, in that sense, there's a real spiritual need there. Um, as well as that, um, the town, about a third of the population, um, is made up of people who've immigrated to the area um, in search of work, in search of opportunities. Um, but unfortunately, that can leave them vulnerable um, to things like exploitation um, and at times trafficking. So that is where most of my work is going to be focused. Um, so I'm going to be partnering um, with ECM, with a church plant there, um, where some of their um, workers are already serving. Um, so that's going to look like a lot of social projects, things like food banks, clothes banks, um, Spanish classes, which are actually really crucial to help people, if they can speak the language, that will um, alleviate that risk of exploitation massively, um, as, as well as some children's ministries as well. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, this work that ECM has been doing has kind of only started up in the past year, so it still is in that kind of um, pioneering phase. So it'll be really great to get stuck in with that um, during this coming year. Kate, this isn't the first time you've been interviewed here at Bangor Worldwide, and it's not the first time you've been involved in a short-term overseas missions. So tell us a little bit about your, your journey before now uh, that brings you to this point. Yeah, so some of you might remember um, two years ago, if you were here, I was interviewed. I had just returned home from Ecuador um, in South America where I'd spent most of the year, um, where I served with Latin Link um, in similar projects with um, vulnerable children there. Um, so overseas ministry is something that I'm really interested in. Um, I've been coming to Worldwide since I was very small, and it captured my attention from, from that young age. Um, and it's just been really great um, to have opportunities to go on short-term teams, um, which I did through my teenage years and then took that year um, between school and uni. Um, I spent some time in France where I went. Um, I went to Bible college in France um, and then spent most of the year in Ecuador. Um, so God has just been so good in giving me opportunities um, 
to serve him in various cultures, various, cultures, various countries, um, yeah, and across the world. Um, and it's a real privilege to be able to do that again um, this year. Um, so it's something that I'm really passionate about um, is education in terms of um, using that as a tool to alleviate um, inequality and, and things like that, especially for girls. Um, and it's just a real blessing to be able to, to do that um, alongside serving God. Um, and just as well as that, the town that I'll be living in, um, there's kind of four main people groups that we'll be focusing on. So we've got the Spanish-speaking locals and the Arabic-speaking um, Moroccans, French-speaking West Africans, and then an English-speaking Nigerian community. So you've got a very diverse um, population. Um, but as I say, I study French and Spanish, and I have been doing a little bit of Arabic. Um, so it's just amazing to see how God has been working um, in just allowing me to, to have those skills um, and just be able to, to use them to serve him. Kate, one, one thing that struck me as I've been talking to you the last few weeks, I, I find it interesting that when you're taking a gap year from a, a languages course in a British university and you approach them and ask them if you can uh, go on full-time Christian mission as your gap year, I was wondering whether that might have created any problems or whether that was difficult for them uh, to give you permission to do that. Can you tell us a little bit about how how that worked out and how that conversation went? Yep, I think we're working here again. Um, this was something that I was quite um, apprehensive about, was breaching this uh, with uni and just kind of asking them um, whether this would be something they would um, allow me to do because I would need their permission. Um, so I got in touch with uni to kind of ask them how they would feel about it and actually they have been... Um, They've been really open to it, um, and actually, so I had a Zoom with one of my lecturers um, and was able just to chat to him about it um, and what it would look like and why I was doing it. So that was really quite a unique opportunity to be able to chat to him about my faith and, and what it brought me um, to take this year with ECM. Um, so I think that's been a real encouragement to me just to see how God's been working even before I've gone to Spain. Um, and also just a reminder that even though we're living in a time where a lot of people are very hostile to the gospel, there's still people who are just interested and, and do want to talk to you about it. Um, so just even for other students, if it's something that you would um, think about and maybe think is not an option for you, it is worth just um, taking that chance um, and asking um, and seeing if that's something that you would be able to do. Kate, thank you for, for sharing everything with us this evening. We'd love to pray for you before you, you set off shortly. Um, what, are the, what are the key things that you'd like us to be mindful of as you uh, set off for Spain soon? Yep, um, thank you so much um, for praying for me, for those of you that do. Um, that is a real privilege, um, and I am very, very grateful uh, for that. Um, so I just asked for three main points um, for prayer as I, as I head out um, to Spain. The first one would be, um, just on a practical note, um, that there wouldn't be any new restrictions or any kind of COVID-related reason that I wouldn't be able to head out. Um, that would be a big one. Um, secondly, I would just pray that um, God would be really blessing the relationships that I'll be seeking to build with people because that will be the key way into chatting to them um, about him. So I would just ask for prayer um, in those, especially um, there'll be quite a lot of people from a Muslim background um, and that's something that's relatively new to me. So I will need um, a lot of wisdom um, and help from God in that. Um, so if you could just be praying for me in that and um, that he would bring about um, real opportunities to share um, about him with the people that I'm meeting. Um, and finally, um, just prayer for the church that I'll be part of. Um, it is quite a small church plant. Um, so just prayer that um, the church and that I'll be a part of, that we would be a real blessing to the community around us, um, especially when there's so few people um, who are believing in Jesus in that area. But yeah, thank you so much. Folks, I thought we'd take a moment just now to begin to pray for Kate and do that together. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Kate and the call that you've placed on her life. Uh, you've repeatedly called her to other parts of the world uh, where she can uh, join in, in the great mission that you have to reach men and women, boys and girls, with the good news of Jesus. Uh, so, Lord, we pray for Kate as she's about to set off uh, for Spain in a few weeks' time. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would, uh, as she's asked us to pray, we pray that you'd 
keep doors open for her in terms of uh, the, the COVID situation. Lord, we, we pray that the, the plans that she has made and that she's working towards, uh, that they would be able to be realized and that she would uh, soon be uh, on location and ready to begin her work. Lord, we pray that when she does go there, uh, she would form quickly a deep and meaningful and open relationships, uh, the kind of relationships that uh, go, go deeper, that, that cut below the surface of things to the things of life that really matter, the kind of relationships where, where she can uh, talk about Jesus and what he means to her and what he could mean uh, to, to other folks she meets. Lord, so we pray for those relationships. Uh, and we do pray for the, the little church there in, in Spain that Kate will be working with. Uh, Lord, we pray that Kate's coming would be a blessing uh, in the short term. Uh, and we pray that you would use this next season while Kate's there uh, to, to, to do good in that community, to build it up uh, so that it, it would grow stronger and stronger uh, with a, a wider reach uh, in, into the, the neighborhood where you've placed it. Lord, we just pray a, a blessing on that church. Uh, and Lord, I pray finally for Kate herself uh, that this, this season in her life that she's about to embark on uh, would be one that in the future she looks back on it uh, and she sees that, that you were right there beside her, that you were hearing and answering her prayers, that you were enabling her and empowering her and using her and Lord even that you were transforming her making her more and more the woman that you want her to be uh, Lord bless Kate we pray Amen Well, we are going to stand together and sing great uh, Christian uh, song, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So let's stand together and sing. Just say 
over the years, it's been a real privilege to have so many men come amongst us to minister God's Word in our morning Bible readings. And it's a delight this year to have Jonathan Lamb. Jonathan is an author and Bible teacher and minister at large for Keswick Ministries, serving the Keswick movement around the world through teaching, writing, and traveling. And so tonight, just for a few moments, Jonathan's going to give us a little bit of an overview as to where we're going this week in our Bible study. So welcome, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and good evening, everyone. Uh, Mark and I are delighted to be here. We've been uh, in Northern Ireland many times, but never to worldwide. So it's a great privilege for us to be joining you this week. Thank you. And uh, during these morning Bible studies, we're going to delve into the little prophecy of Habakkuk under the title, Trusting the Lord in Turbulent Times. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Habakkuk. He's not a prophet that we uh, read about too often. You may even have difficulty locating him in the Bible. But I'm here to help you. He's between Nahum and Zephaniah. <laughs> and um, this lovely little prophecy has been a great help to me over the years because it's extremely realistic, it's very honest, and it is full of certainty that the Lord reigns. And that, in fact, is why I thought it might be good for us to look at it over these five sessions. Our theme is the Lord reigns, and there's absolutely no doubt Habakkuk affirms that reality. But he does so by going through a very demanding journey. And uh, let me explain just quickly a couple of reasons why that's the case. The first thing is, you know that in the Bible, and certainly in this little prophecy, there is a point of tension between what we believe and what we sing about and what is happening in our world. It was true for Habakkuk, and it is definitely true for us. So we affirm our Lord reigns, God reigns. We affirm his sovereignty and control. But there are so many events in our world and in our own personal lives which might lead us to the conclusion that we have some doubts about that truth. Habakkuk begins his prophecy by asking God very difficult questions about why these things are happening in Jerusalem of his day, why uh, he allows the wicked to be in charge. He's full of questions. Why does God allow this? It's the point of tension between what we believe about the God who's in control and what we see in our world. And of course, we can imagine the small group of believers in Afghanistan or in North Korea or in other parts of the world, or indeed in our own setting, where things happen which raise a question mark about God's sovereignty or control. I'm sure that's happened in your life. I always remember a little remark made by um, the bishop in South Africa, Desmond Tutu, who he said, there are times when for sure we want to say to God, God, we know you're in charge, but why don't you make it slightly more obvious? And that is part of what Habakkuk is beginning to encounter uh, as he asks God these tough questions. But then the second thing that we need to remember as we enter that little prophecy is something, again, we struggle with, and that is Habakkuk was in between the promises which God had made and their ultimate fulfillment. He was in the waiting room. And therefore, that was an uncomfortable moment, and we'll look on Tuesday morning at what this waiting means for us as well. We've had great promises made by God to us and about uh, the future. We still have to wait for some of those to be fulfilled. We're in a better position than Habakkuk, of course. We know the Lord Jesus, and we know how all of God's promises are fulfilled in him. But that same experience of waiting is also ours. So the prophecy teaches us about what it means to wait, how to hold on to God's promises with a kind of steadfast believing, which he talks about in chapter 2, how it's possible uh, to trust God's promises even through these periods of waiting. And then the third thing to mention is that this little prophecy helps us most of all because Habakkuk discovered that he could put his trust in God in a turbulent world because of what God had said to him. Again, we'll look in chapter 2 at the moment when up on the walls of Jerusalem, God gave his revelation to Habakkuk. And we do the same. We come to his word so that we have a perspective for our own lives on the world in which we live. And Habakkuk was given a remarkable vision of God's judgments. We'll be looking at that on Wednesday. It's important that we do so because God is a God of judgment. 
not only uh, in the future, but even in our own world now, and also a great vision of his saving acts, a wonderful uh, song in chapter 3, which uh, reveals how God has acted in the past and will act in the future in saving his people. So trusting God in a turbulent world is possible. As we hear this word, we trust God's promises. I suppose many of us will know the little doxology at the end of Habakkuk, though the fig tree do not blossom. Uh, though there be no fruit on the vine, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's probably the most famous part of the prophecy. But I think that we realize how significant that lovely doxology is after we've made the journey with uh, Habakkuk from those big questions through to all of the challenges of waiting, through the issues of judgment and deliverance, and then he can finally find his feet on solid rock. Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. So uh, may we welcome you to that journey, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 11.30 as we walk through this little prophecy. Thank you very much. Well, I hope that has whetted your appetite as it has whetted mine as we look forward to all that God has to say to us. Such a timely subject for I think each one of us as individuals in our churches and wherever God scatters you uh, during the week to hear that the Lord does indeed reign in the midst of turbulent circumstances. But before we hear uh, from Bishop Michael, we're going to sing again another uh, great anthem of the Christian faith, ancient of days, another great modern hymn, but picks up the great theology of who our God is. So let's stand together and sing. i 
Well, again, we have another privilege this evening to welcome Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, originally from South West Asia, and he was the first uh, diocesan bishop in the Church of England, born abroad, and he was also the General Secretary of CMS and Bishop of Raiwand in Pakistan. He is the current president of of Oxstrad, and it's a great uh, privilege to welcome here tonight. But we're going to do a short interview before I read the passage for tonight. So, uh, Bishop Michael, I'll pass you uh, the mic. You're no stranger to these shores, uh, Bishop Michael, but for some uh, maybe watching online tonight or some in the building who haven't come across you before, maybe could you give us a quick overview of your ministry? Well, I think you've just done that, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that's probably enough. But yes, uh, I come from a largely Shia Muslim family, and um, I came personally to faith in Christ uh, at university. That's quite important, isn't it? So many people do, and we have to work with them and pray for them. Um, and I have worked uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, Southwest Asia has been mentioned. That's been very strongly represented here with Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan as areas of concern for Christian mission. Uh, and I now work, um, I resigned as the Bishop of Rochester um, to work uh, in developing leadership uh, in churches where there has been serious persecution. So. I'm well aware of what is happening in Afghanistan. Even before all of this, I remember we trained uh, not so long ago six Bible teachers for Afghanistan. As far as I know, two of them have already been killed. Um, so not, not in these uh, present circumstances, but before them. So it's always been very dangerous, and we need to hold those believers in our prayers and work for relieving them in their need now, urgent need now. Just a few other questions, Bishop Michael. You've had a very extensive ministry working in the halls of parliament, uh, with the lords, with the archbishop. Have, have the questions changed over the years in the West? You've obviously reflected on some of the things that are happening so far away from us, but as you've ministered over the years, normal people like us on the street are the questions people are asking different to 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Yeah, well, uh, when I began this work, I thought most of my work would be overseas. Uh, but then uh, a Christian leader, a woman actually, she said to me, uh, you're doing all this for people being persecuted elsewhere. What about those being persecuted in Britain? So I said, well, who are they? And um, I can, I now know that there are well, more than a hundred people, certainly, certainly that, maybe many more, who have lost their jobs or their professional accreditation or their public appointments as magistrates or whatever, simply because of their Christian faith. I know you've had some famous cases here, mm. uh, but that can be duplicated all over the country. And of course, this is different from persecution in Iran or Pakistan uh, or Afghanistan. Uh, but nevertheless, if you lose your job, if you lose your professional status, uh, and if Christians are increasingly excluded from public life just because they're Christians, that's quite serious. So, yeah, I think that is happening. Uh, that will increase. Uh, Christians will find it more and more difficult to be in certain areas, in certain professions, uh, the medical profession, for instance. Uh, so those questions have changed in the last 10, 15 years. Thank you, Bishop Michael. You did say I could ask you anything. I did, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sort of rash thing to say. <laughs> our, our great theme this week is, is the Lord reigns. Yeah. And we think about world mission, but there was a commentator once said that the Christian church can be a bit like a lighthouse. We seek to illumine distant lands and leave the bottom of the lighthouse in darkness. So when we go out into our streets here in Bangor or in North Down, and we meet our non-Christian neighbor, and they ask me, Johnny, where is God in a global pandemic? 
is God the author of this? Did God ordain this? This is a very easy question for the bishop uh, to answer in a couple of minutes. But as we think evangelistic, that big question that people are asking, where is your God yeah. in a pandemic? Well, um, the God of the Bible and the God of Christians is working to relieve suffering wherever it may happen in whatever way. That may be through human beings, it may be through scientific discovery. I mean, have we ever asked ourselves, what is it that makes it possible for us to discover a vaccine within a year uh, of this virus breaking out? Who has given us this capacity? So uh, that, that, of course, um, uh, can be said. But the Christian story remains the best story to explain why we are here at all, why the world is here, uh, and what we are doing in it, and why we can understand it, even if not fully. Um, so um, there is no alternative. I sometimes have debates with atheists, and once the name-calling has finished, th there's no case that they can put. Um, I was talking to an atheist this morning. He came to church, you know, and I said to him, well, actually, an atheist is quite a good position to be in because you've already rejected all the false gods. That's true, isn't it, if by definition. So all that remains for you, I said to this young man, is to accept the true God. Uh, well, let's pray that he does. He came to church this morning. Well, thank you, Bishop Michael. Just before you come to uh, speak to us, let's turn to God's Word, Psalm 97, as we continue this theme, which will take us into our uh, morning Bible readings in the morning. Psalm 97, there should be uh, perhaps it on the screen or a Bible in front of you, the Lord reigns. Psalm 97, and we'll read from verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around his lightnings light up the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. All worshippers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, First of all, may I say a huge thank you to Hamilton uh, Road Presbyterian Church and to Pastor Christoph for your hospitality in allowing me into this uh, pulpit. I feel a bit of an interloper, actually, in a sort of Baptist Presbyterian fest. And um, I, Bishop walking into the Presbyterian Church, which I did earlier, and I thought, well, there might be a riot if people saw this. Uh, so I got in rather quickly. Um, I don't know what the result of my preaching will be, but we'll see. Uh, I know you're peaceful people. Well, I was, uh, I've been intrigued for some time since I learned what the overall theme uh, of Bangor Worldwide was this year. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. And I thought, well, why, why have they chosen this um, title, this overall theme? I still, I'm not totally sure of of the answer yet, but maybe Jonathan has given me a bit of a clue. 
why the sovereignty of God has to be affirmed at this time of difficulty for the world, for our nation, and for so many people and so many homes. Uh, this uh, psalm, by the way, Psalm 97, is uh, one of a clutch of psalms in the 90s. This, uh, uh, and um, uh, these psalms um, are sometimes called the royal psalms. Uh, they are about God's sovereignty, about uh, God being enthroned as Lord. And it is thought that there uh, was a festival that the ancient Israelites uh, had when they particularly affirmed the sovereignty of God uh, in terms of observing a festival, in terms of, of worship. Um, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. And that is repeated over some of these Psalms. Uh, God's sovereignty. But the sovereignty of the Lord uh, is of a particular kind, as the Psalm immediately goes on to say. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. You see, the word that is used for righteousness uh, is a word that means an inward rightness, uh, something that has to do uh, with character. So it is the character of God, Sedek, it is God's character to be righteous. The righteousness of God, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Well, we, as we say that and we know what it means, but of course, uh, in that context, with all the gods of the nations round about, this was a very unique thing to say because the pagan gods, well, what was their character then? Uh, they were characterized by fickleness, uh, arbitrary acts, uh, doing whatever they liked, uh, with humankind. They were characterized uh, not only by fickleness, uh, but by uh, cruelty and vengeance. They were uh, uh, characterized by, well, I suppose a polite word might be flirtatiousness. It's actually much worse than that. So against that, the Bible is saying that the God of the Bible is a God whose sovereignty is founded not on any of these things, but on righteousness and justice. An amazing statement to make. And because uh, of this inward righteousness, this inward character of the rightness of God, that is why the earth can rejoice. Because you see, creation, as it was so often thought of in the pagan world, is not a mere plaything of the gods. It's not being made just for sport, for them. Creation has a solemn purpose. It has a serious destiny. It is headed somewhere. Well, of course, we know that because of our own wrongdoing, creation has been subjected to futility, as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8. But even so, he goes on then to speak of the great deliverance that creation is awaiting along with us. That is why the earth can rejoice because of God's character. And not only the earth, but the heavens also proclaim this rightness, you see. Um, all creatures of our God and King, we have just sung. The whole of creation tells us about this God who is righteous and who is just. Uh, Paul again in the first uh, chapter of, of the letter to the Romans uh, points out that if only we would look, if only we weren't spiritually and intellectually blind, we would see what the heavens and the earth are actually saying about this being. As I was saying earlier to Jonathan, 
The Christian explanation remains the best explanation of why there is a world and why we are there in that world and what the purpose is of the world and of ourselves, by far. So often we find uh, that what is mere description of the world and its wonder is taken to be an explanation. But the explanation is here. It is the Lord who is righteous in character and just, who is the explanation for this world and for our own existence. But then it goes on to speak of the peoples, all the peoples. All the peoples behold his glory. Yes, their eyes have been dimmed, even blinded perhaps. Yes, uh, their perceptions are distorted. But God has not abandoned human beings. He has not abandoned human society. Uh, there still remains, in spite of our rebellion and our obstructiveness and our willfulness, there still remains God's providential care for society. So when we uh, witness in the world, Jonathan was asking me about it, whether it's in parliament or on the street, both very important, by the way, it is this continuing providential care of God for human society, for human persons, it is on this basis that we bear witness. Um, the structures, the fundamental structures of society have been preserved, you see. Uh, whether that is the family, perhaps the most important unit of society, and that of course is why it is under such severe attack, or whether it is the local community. I'm always um, struck by how cohesive this community in Bangor seems. Or whether it is a nation. All of these are part of God's providential purpose in upholding society and his purpose uh, to reveal himself more fully uh, to those willing to listen and to see. But then it is not just heaven and earth, it's not just human society in general, it narrows down. Zion hears and is glad. Uh, my translation says the daughters of Judah rejoice. I think the nearly infallible version says uh, the villages of Judah. And it is true that villages and towns in Israel um, and in Judah were sometimes called the daughters of Judah. But it is about God choosing the particular to do his work, you see. Um, we've just heard how people are called to particular work. Particular people called to particular work in particular areas. We've heard from Kate just now about her calling uh, in the Spanish-speaking uh, part of the world. And this is about God's choice of a people. Now, I've always been um, interested in why God called this people, a nomadic group of tribes wandering around in the deserts of the Middle East, despised by the great powers around them, uh, Assyria and Babylon and Egypt, uh, Persia later, uh, Greece and Rome, enslaved by them, oppressed by them. And God called them and upheld them and preserved them and the empires have all disappeared. But the people are still there. You see, this is the miracle of Israel. That is why Zion can hear and be glad and the daughters of Judah rejoice. God's election of an unlikely people for the fulfillment of his purposes in the world and among us. And then, of course, that narrows down even more, doesn't it, in the person, in the coming. We heard 
uh, just now from Christoph, I think, uh, who, uh, who was, um, uh, or was it Jonathan, uh, saying how God's purposes are being fulfilled in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in his work, uh, in his dying, in his rising again, and the promise of his return. And so um, we find then that the psalm comes from this great vision uh, of God's purposes uh, in the world and among human beings um, to a more personal address, if you like. Uh, the Lord loves, my translation has it, the Lord loves those who hate evil. But actually it could also be translated those who love the Lord hate evil. And I think there is a duality here that might be worth thinking about. The Lord loves, in the Bible, that is always prior. Without God's love, there is no capacity in us to love properly. Every kind of love that we have without that is distorted and what St. Augustine of Hippo called perverse. It is God's love that makes it possible for us to love God and to love one another, even those who are most unlike us. You see, we talk about the unreached, uh, and the fact of the matter is that uh, from our point of view, most of the unreached are people who are not like us at all. And what is it that gives us the capacity to love them? The Lord loves, and because of that, we can love, and because of that, we can turn away from what is not love, what is not really love at all, what is contrary to God's purposes for human living. But then, um, interestingly enough, what is said about God about the Lord at the beginning of the psalm is then said about the believer. You see, the succession of phrases, light dawns for the righteous or is sown for the righteous, joy for the upright in heart, the same thing, rejoice in the Lord, O you who are righteous. Now, how did that happen? How did a creation gone wrong? How did human beings capable only of the perversity that we've turned love into, how did they become righteous, you see? That is the key, isn't it, that uh, this is the gospel, that God, in providing Jesus the only righteous and just person who by his obedience, um, has opened for us the gate of once again friendship with God, of being accepted by God on the basis of Christ's justice and righteousness, but then also gradually being made Christ-like. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin God made to be a sin offering for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. You see. Amazing that the very character of God, he is described as righteous. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne is then used for us, this possibility. And so what can be said of those who are righteous and made just in this way, light is sown for them. A strange metaphor, sowing light. We don't often speak of it like that, which is why some translations um, try to uh, say something like light dawns for the righteous or something like that. Uh, but it reminds me very strongly of the opening of St. John's Gospel, where it says the light that was from the beginning, was coming into the world 
so that that light may illumine human hearts and minds, you see. So once we are right with God, our minds and hearts are illuminated. And then it speaks of joy. We've been singing about joy. Christoph has been uh, talking about joy. Joy for those who are upright in their hearts. Once again, this is not just doing the right things or saying the right things, but it is an inner or orientation uh, towards the very source of our being. And that is what enables the psalmist to say, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks for the remembrance of his name. I think in um, the um, NIV and the RSV, which I've got open, the translation is a little weak. Give thanks to his holy name, I've got. I think the NIV has something very similar. Uh, but I think it actually says something like, give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name. And this idea of remembering God's mighty acts in creation and redemption is central to the Bible. And in the Older Testament, there used to be a sacrifice uh, called a memorial sacrifice. Um, and remembrance of God's mighty acts of creation and redemption, that's not just about what's happened in the past, but claiming those acts of uh, creation and redemption for ourselves today uh, as those who have made, been made righteous in Christ, those who have been illuminated with the light of the eternal word, and those who've been given the joy of salvation. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the heavens proclaim his righteousness. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous. But I need to finish on a solemn note, I think, uh, and that is that there is also a dark side to this psalm. You will have spotted it, of course. Uh, this God who is righteous and just is also the one who judges. In fact, we could say righteousness and judgment are the foundation of his throne. Um, judgment in the Bible is so often what we do to ourselves. Uh, we make for our own judgment. And it is so here. So what is fundamentally wrong is idolatry. See, idolatry is the root of all sin. This is also Paul's argument in the letter to the Romans. Um, to worship the creature instead of the creator. See, that is what idolatry is about. Uh, that may be another person. It may be self-worship, and that's increasing in our world. It may be worship of an idea or an ideology, as with the Taliban in Afghanistan, or as with Marxism in China. It could be obsession uh, with a person or a thing or a place. Many forms that the devil can take in deceiving us. So idolatry is the root of oppression. God delivers his saints, it says, from the hand of the oppressor, of the wicked. But wickedness is an evil, the oppression of other people, the ex improper exercise of power over them. And then we are told that this God who has shown his graciousness in his creation and in his redemption is also the one where fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about, you see. So by not living in the way that God has shown us, we can destroy ourselves. 
that is the, the dark side, the shadow side, but also true of the psalm. And we need to take that seriously in our proclamation of the gospel, in sharing the good news with people to say that they must turn away from what can be very bad news for them, as I was telling this young man this morning, to what can be good news for them. The good news comes to life, becomes real, when people realize the bad news in which they are caught up. But let us finish with the good news. Uh, let us pray that people will indeed see as they come through this pandemic that the Lord does reign, that the world is ordered towards a good end, that the earth does rejoice and will rejoice, and that the heavens will show us the truth of the Lord who reigns. Amen. Um, thank you, Michael, for bringing us that, uh, that word from Psalm 97, uh, that reminder and exposition of the, the theme of God's reign. Uh, thank you also to Kate and to Johnny, uh, to Jonathan, uh, and those who have taken part in this evening's service. Thank you all for that. Just now we're going to sing our closing hymn together, closing song. It's, it's a, a wonderful call to continue into our week where our psalm leaves off. Our psalm finishes, Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Let's stand, sing together, O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Let's worship.
Folks, thank you for joining with us this evening. I was struck by what Michael was sharing from Psalm 97 towards the end where it talks about the, the light that uh, at the opening of the psalm comes from the throne of God, that, that same light uh, finally is sown on us. Hard to believe that he's making something of us for his glory. Let me part you with a blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.